ever wondered why so many Hollywood celebrities look so good? We're asking some deep questions this morning at church. This week I was reading on the internet, Sandra Bullock gets acupuncture three times a week, including needles stuck in her stomach, her feet, and her face, and she believes that it keeps her looking youthful. How about that? And when a studio signs a contract with her, that's included in her fee, and they gladly pay it. That's why she's looking so good. I don't know. Some of you may want to check out some acupuncture. I'm not sure, but there's also Blake Lively, who has committed herself to eat a totally organic diet. No sugar, no dairy, no gluten, just raw fruits and vegetables, and that's why she's looking so good. But it's not just the women of Hollywood. It's also people like The Rock, Dwayne Johnson. The Rock, I mean, The Rock is huge. And The Rock attributes his size and his mass to the priority of working out. He wakes up at 4 o'clock in the morning every single day to pump iron. In fact, he's got a picture that comes up on his phone when his alarm goes off every morning. How about that? If you woke up and saw that, you would jump out of bed motivated, wouldn't you, to work out? The Rock loves to exercise and loves to, to pump iron, and that's why he's so big and bad and all that. Beyonce contributes her beauty to spending hours of putting on creams and lotions on her face and makeup and all kinds of other things. Um, what you could say with each one of these individuals the reason that they look the way they do is because it's a priority, right? It's a priority. I mean, you could, if you wanted to, and some of you may do this, I don't know, wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning to pump iron. You could get some acupuncture if you really wanted to. You could spend hours putting on your makeup. Some of you probably do. But the question is, is it a priority? Is it a priority? And we have only so much time in our life to prioritize certain things. And therefore, we have to pick the things that we value the most. I remember when I was in middle school, I had a really good friend that was making straight A's. I mean, he was a super smart kid. And by the way, he went to a really prestigious university, and he's making a lot of money these days. But I said to him, I said, how are you always making straight A's? You know, I was struggling making B's. And he said, oh, Ryan, it's simple. He said, I, I write down over here, and he pulled out like this little notebook, because this was kind of like back in the day, and he wrote down a summary of what the teacher talked about and what we did in class. And then he would go over his notes every single night for every single class for 15 minutes at a time. And I said to him, you can do that? You know, I, you don't even have an assignment due the next day, and... And you don't have a test, and you're still studying? And he's like, yeah, that's the whole key. I got to tell you, it wasn't that much of a priority for me. I was more like cram the night before kind of person. He made a lot, more, a lot better grades than I did. You know, in the Christian life, it's all about priorities. Priorities. What do we value the most? And that's why Jesus spoke to this in Matthew chapter 6. He said this about a person's priorities. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you or given to you as well. In other words, if we will seek the kingdom, then God will add all the other things to us. Well, I mean, the other things that we need and the other things that we're looking for and the other things that, that, that we have to have, God says, if you'll do this first thing, if you'll seek the kingdom first, then I'll take care of everything else. That's priority, isn't it? Priority. God wants us to live by kingdom priorities. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people live by a different set of priorities, right? We live by priorities. Many times we're not seeking first the kingdom. We're seeking first ourselves, or we're seeking first to the approval of somebody else or some goal that we're trying to reach. But the Bible reminds us, seek first the kingdom, seek first the kingdom, and then all these things will be added unto you. So the question is, how do we seek first the kingdom? Because we live in a distracted world, don't we? I mean, everywhere we turn, there are 
so many distractions, so many things to draw our priorities away from the things that really matter. Because when we begin to prioritize one thing, that means we have to do less of another thing. Is that the truth? Right? You can't do all of everything all the time. You have to pick. I want to be about this. I want to value that. I care about this. And that's not so important. And that's not so important. And I'm going to put those things over here because I'm not focused on those things at, at this time. It's all about priority, right? It's about priority. Are you guys awake this morning? Yeah, okay, I'm just making sure. Everybody's like quiet. I feel like I'm at Episcopalian Mass today. I don't know what happened. Maybe everybody was eight, out a little late last night watching the Kentucky Derby or something. I don't know what you guys were doing, but no, we're at church, all right? Everybody say amen. amen. Okay, there you go. Okay, good. We're back on track. So we got to get our life in alignment with God, right? Seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added. From time to time, I go over to the chiropractor's office when my body gets out of alignment and, you know, my back may hurt and my, I may feel kind of out of whack and my neck may feel twisted and he'll crack, crack, crack. And it's, it's a very awesome thing. And I leave there and I shout hallelujah, amen, because I'm feeling so good. And then my body's in alignment. feels better. You know, God wants us to get our priorities in alignment with him. Let's get those priorities. That's why the first of the Ten Commandments, do you know what it is? The very first one? You shall have no other gods before me. God wants to be first. God will not be second. God will not be third. God will not be on the side. God wants to be first. He wants to be first. Seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added to you. One of the ways that's so important for us to put God first in our life is in bringing tithes and offerings. One of the very important things that the Bible teaches us. And the reason that we should make tithing and giving a priority is because it's putting God first. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 14. The purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your life. It's to put God first in your life. And Jesus said this, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's priority, right? That's priority. Now, sometimes we say we have certain priorities, but the greatest indicator of what a priority really is, is what we do. It's not just what we say. So when Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, what he's saying is we need to get our life in kingdom priority. We need to get our heart in alignment with God. And the way that we do that is by bringing the tithes and bringing those offerings. The purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first, and it's a spiritual habit. Now, a tithe is what? It's a tenth portion, right? It's a tenth portion. In fact, the word tithe actually means tenth means 10th percentage. So if my income was $1,000, then what would a tithe be? Somebody help me. $100. You guys are really smart. Yes, $100. Right, very good. Yeah. And a tithe is on all of our income. You know, if I have one job, tithe. If my spouse has a job, we tithe on my income and on her income. If I have a second job, then I tithe on that second income. If I make money some other way, I tithe on that. A tenth portion of all of our increase and all of our produce, the Bible says, belongs to God. And when we do this, we get our life in alignment with Him and our heart in alignment with Him. And we say, God, I want you to be number one in my life. If we say, God, I want you to be number one in my life but last place in my budget, then that's a contradiction, right? So we want to line our pocketbook up with what we say that we believe and what we say that we really and truly value. Our finances simply reflect these priorities in our lives. Now, if you look in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 13, we see this, this idea of the first. Okay, the first. Everybody say the first. The first, yeah. Exodus 13 too. Check this out. You are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb, and all the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. So check this out. In ancient times, the Hebrew people, if mama cow had a baby calf, the first calf went to the house of worship. Went to God. 
If mama cow only had one cow, then God got the only offspring. If mama cow had ten cows, it didn't matter. The first cow went to the house, and the other nine cows stayed with the owner. The first belonged to God. That's why when we bring tithes, we bring the first portion. And practically speaking, if you wait to the end of the month to start giving, you will never have enough. It won't be there. So we bring the first part to God. And in our family, we bring the tithe to God even before we pay our mortgage, right? And I love my house, don't get me wrong, okay? But we love God more. God gets the first. The tithe is that first portion, that first part. And in saying that, I'm saying, God, I trust you. I'm bringing the first portion. And God, I'm believing that the other 90% is going to be enough of what I need. And we're going to trust in your provision in doing so. The first portion. So how do I begin to tithe? You know, I think a lot of people today think tithing is a good thing. And we admire people that tithe. And we think we should tithe. But sometimes there's a disconnect between what I think is admirable and what I actually do. Is that the truth? Sometimes that's harder than, 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 than it seems. So how do we begin to do that? Well, I want to give you some very practical stuff today related to this. Okay, How do I tithe? Number one, change my mindset. We've been in a series about mindset. Listen. If you're going to have a fruitful and productive life, you got to change your mindset, okay? Uh, we saw in week one of this series that, that uh, Tira did half of what God said. And he, and, he, and he stayed in a place called Haran instead of going to the land of Canaan. And he did half of what God said. And he had to change his mindset, or Abraham had to change his mindset. He had to think differently about things. If you're going to be a tither, you got to think differently, you can't think the way that you used to think. Now, here's one mindset. I'll never have enough, right? That's probably the biggest mindset. I, will, I won't have enough. A lot of people, I would love to tithe. I won't have enough. Check out Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Okay, this is a mindset shift. Everybody say mindset. Mindset. Yeah, give and you shall receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Press down, shaken together to make room for more. Running over, poured uh, into your lap. In other words, when we give, God gives back to us, okay? So we can't take God out of the equation. If you're just looking at your bottom line, I got this much money coming in, I can't do this, that's a mindset. But remember this, God blesses people who are generous, okay? Don't, 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 don't forget that. It's a mindset shift. So the mindset shift is from I won't have enough to I will have enough because God's going to lead me and God's going to bless me. It's a big difference, big thinking change. Um, some people say, I'll start later, you know, but inevitably we just keep putting it off, keep waiting. Listen, it is always a great time to put God first. Now is a great time to put God first in our finances and in our life. Let's don't wait. Let's don't wait. Uh, I would do it if things were better, right? How many of us have said that? Yeah, I would do it if things were, man, my job is so uncertain and I got this extra bill and all. Hey, listen, if you wait till things are quote-unquote better, you will never do it because you're always going to have some type of adversity in your life, you know? And then sometimes it may just be, the mindset may just be, well, this is all my stuff, you know? This is all my stuff. And, and we're reminded in the scripture that all, everything that we have actually belongs to God and not to us. Uh, in fact, if you look at Haggai chapter 2, verse 8, he says, The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. In other words, God says, everything you've got, baby, belongs to me. It's all God's. Do you know that? The house you live in belongs to God. The car you drive belongs to God. The clothes you're wearing today belong to God. It all belongs to God. We're just a steward of the resources that God has given to us. We're not really the owners. See, when we see ourselves as a steward and not an owner, it's a little bit easier to be generous, right? Because you're like, okay, God, well, um, this is all yours anyway, God, so then how much would you like for me to give? That's totally different from, God, this is all my stuff. I may give you a little bit. Do you see the shift? It's a mindset, okay? It's a mindset. we got to change our thinking to get in line with God. Here's another mindset shift for us right here. Deuteronomy 8.18, you shall remember the Lord your God. For it is he who is the one who gives you the power to get wealth. The reason that you're excelling in your job is because of God. 
The reason you had the education is because of God. The reason that your boss is patting you on the back and telling you you're doing a great job is because of God. See, when we think that this is all stuff that we came up with and I'm so great and I'm so gifted and intelligent and we pull God out of the equation, then we feel like, oh, all this belongs to me. But when we see that God is the one that gave us the ability to earn wealth, then we have a spirit of gratitude, right? And that spirit of gratitude drives us towards generosity. So it's the Lord that gave you the ability. You wouldn't have nothing without the Lord. So everything you've got is a bonus. It's a mindset. Okay, we've got to change that mindset. Now here's the second thing. We've got a budget. Okay? We've got a budget. How do I tithe? Well, I change my mindset and I budget. I plan. I plan. If you are not a budgeter, you will never be a tither. In fact, I have seen people who wanted to start tithing, so they started budgeting, and then they began to manage all their money better, and they actually had a lot more money than they did even before because they started managing it better, but it all was, uh, you know, it was all prompted by the tithe and the desire to tithe. So budget. Look at this in 1 Corinthians 16 too. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collection will, will have been made. What's the apostle saying? You have to plan. Okay, you got to prepare. If you just go to the mall and you start charging your card up and you start spending all kinds of money on stuff you don't really need, you will never have money for anything else. But if you will make a plan and you will say, I'm going to put God first, I'm going to put God in the top line of the budget, tithe at the top, then you'll be prepared and then you'll be able to do so. Okay? So you, so you, so you got to plan, you got to prepare, you got to get that budget. Um, I'm, I'm kind of celebrating now. I just got rid of my 2004 runner. I drove that car for 16 years. Whoa. Other people have been coming up after the early service. They've been telling me how old their forerunners are. I guess they're a really good car. It was good for me. And my kids were begging me, Dad, please get rid of the forerunner. It smells bad, Dad. <laughs> you know, it's not cool. Don't drop us off at school, you know, in the forerunner. We want mom's car, you know, and all that. And I'm like, it's paid for. It's paid for. And I tithe. How about that? <laughs> I drove that old car for a long time. It's still a great car. Maybe I should have driven it longer. I got a newer car, though. I'm thankful. I've been saving for 16 years. You know, when you, when you budget and you plan a little bit, then, then you can buy something better at some point. But, you know, for a long time, I drove the old car. But, you know... I was able to tithe. I was able to be generous. I was able to save. I was able to do other things. And life is so much about priorities and about sacrifice and about what we're willing to do. And a lot of people want to have everything now and they don't want to make any sacrifices. And then they wonder why they're so frustrated when they get what they think they desired. But it really didn't satisfy them as much as they thought that it would have. Budget, plan. Get that plan together. Get your budget together. Uh, my wife began uh, babysitting at the old age of 11 years old, her and her twin sister started a, a twin babysitting little company. It was her and her sister. And her mom gave her a ledger. And she said, girls, this is what you're going to do. You're going to give 10 to God, tithe, 20% to savings, and you can spend 70% on movies or clothes or whatever 11-year-old girls like to spend money on. And so a mindset was established in my wife's heart and life as a young girl because her parents taught her. Listen, parents, we need to be teaching kids about generosity and about tithing. You know, it's so much easier when you've been doing it your whole life rather than trying to start in adulthood. So let's teach the children and let's get on the budget and let's get planned out so we can do some great things for God. Now, when you, when you budget, you, you can't budget everything uh, with, with, with no margin. You know, a lot of people spend all they have and then they borrow more. And then they wonder why they're so stressed out. We need margin in the budget. Leave a little room there for, 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 for God to do something extra. Okay? And if you want to bless somebody, you know, a little extra at the end of the month, wouldn't it be great that you had a little margin there? Or if you wanted to give a little bit more in the offering, you could do that if you wanted to. Or maybe you just wanted to save the money. But isn't that great to have a little margin? And budget should help us margin and help us plan and prepare. This is exactly what the apostle is saying to the Corinthian church. Plan your giving. Get prepared to give. 
Don't just throw a little change in the offering basket when it comes by, but really you spend more when you go out to eat lunch this afternoon. You know, plan it out. Prepare. Be ready to bring those tithes. And then thirdly, we trust God. And see, budgeting and trusting God actually go together because, because if you just budget but you don't trust God, you'll just be a budget hound. <laughs> you can't take faith out of the, out of the equation. I mean, God's, God's presence and his power and his, and his provision in your life is something that, that requires faith and confidence. And sometimes that doesn't show up in the budget. So I have to budget to do the plan, but I also have to operate in faith. Do you see it? Do you see those things together? Budget and faith. Faith and budget. Don't just be a budget hound. Don't just be a person that has no plan that says, I'm just going to believe God and see what happens. You gotta ha you, both extremes will lead you down the path of, of error. But when you put those things together, I budget and I operate in faith. That's when you prepared for God to do something awesome. Look at Malachi chapter 3. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Not part of the tithe, but the whole tithe. That there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not be room enough for it. And this is the only time in the Bible that the scripture says, test me in this. The only time the Bible says test God is in tithes, is in giving. So he says, bring the whole tithe, and then he says, test me in this. He says, now if you do it, then I will open the floodgates of heaven, then you'll be blessed, right? You'll be blessed. Yeah. So we operate in faith. God, I'm doing my budget. It isn't all working out. I don't know how this is all going to, I'm feeling led to do this, but I don't see how it's all, I'm going in faith. Uh, God's going to open the floodgates of heaven okay, to do it. I'm, 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 I'm operating in, in a standard, in a realm I've not been before. okay. And it's a conditional promise. Notice he says there, if you will do this, then I will do that. If you will bring the tithe, then I will open the floodgates of heaven. There's some promises in the Bible that are, that are uh, not conditional. God loves me, not conditional. There are many that are conditional, and this is one of them. If you do this, then God will do this. Isn't that great? So if we will be faithful in the tithe, then God will open the floodgates of heaven. And that's what it means to, to begin to operate in faith. Now, when this begins to happen, when I begin to tithe, what begins to take place in my life? Number one, my faith grows. How many of us would like our faith to grow? Okay. You'd like to be more dependent on God, right? See, you used to have that extra money. Now you don't have it anymore. And so you're trusting God, right? I mean, you're praying a little harder than you used to pray. And you're like, you know, asking God to do something. You're praying some bigger prayers. And you're doing some things you haven't done before. Because, because now you're operating in the faith realm. And, and therefore, you're, you're, you're getting closer to God. You know, that's a great thing. You're, you're more dependent on God. Before you thought, man, I'm kind of dependent on myself. I kind of need God a little bit. Now you're like, I really need the Lord. This is what 2 Corinthians 8, 1 and 2 says. And now, my brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace of God who has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of very severe trial, their overflowing joy and extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. So these destitute people in the Macedonian church are giving generously. I mean, isn't that beautiful? Because sometimes we think, well, if I was just wealthy, I would be generous. Actually, people who are wealthy, it's actually harder for wealthy people to be generous than it is for poor people. And the reason is when you have so much, it's hard to let go of more. But in the Macedonian church, people were in poverty and they were practicing generosity. Listen, they had every excuse to not give. They had every reason to not be generous. And yet what happened? Out of their extreme poverty, they were still generous, right? It's hard. It's hard. If you're a wealthy person, it's hard to give because you're like, I have so much. But if you start giving early in your career, in your life, and you do it incrementally, and you've just always done it, it's no big deal. You know? You're just making a normal salary, and you're bringing, you know, a few hundred dollars a month in tithe, and then you make more, and then that increases, and that in and then, then all of a sudden, when you're, when you're at the top of your income level, you've always been doing it. It's simple. It's harder when you start when you're here, right? But it's going to draw you close to God, 
It's going to re- require more faith, and, and, and God is what I like to call a creative provider. God has so many ways to provide for you. Don't buy into the lie that says, the only way God can provide for my needs is, is simply by, you know, my salary, my main income. God can provide for you in hundreds of different ways. God is so creative. Don't miss it. God can provide for you by other jobs or gifts or a decrease in expenses. I mean, the list goes, let's operate in faith. Let's not be people that are robots, right? We're believing God. And when we believe God, the Christian life has, it has breath and life to it. It has vitality to it. And, 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 and so we're expecting God to do something awesome, okay? Now, here's the second thing. What happens when I tithe? My faith grows, but my ministry flourishes, okay? My ministry flourishes. In Romans 16, I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to tell it to you. There's a lady named Phoebe that's a leader in the church, and Paul is instructing people to give to support her ministry in the church because, uh, because she's a woman that has done a great job and she needs financial assistance, okay? In other words, when we give, ministry flourishes, When we give, ministry happens, okay? The same is true at Edge Church. When you're generous at Edge Church, guess what? People come to faith in Christ. Last week, we saw a huge video of a ton of baptisms here at Edge Church. That comes as we give, okay? Uh, We had our student takeover weekend this last weekend. And Friday night, several kids gave their life to Christ. Teenagers, is that not awesome? That's something to celebrate. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we went down and fed the homeless uh, with, the, with our student ministry on Saturday morning. And we took a, uh, a ton of lunches, like sack lunches for homeless people. And the ministry we were partnering with in downtown Denver said, we've never had so much food donated to the homeless. And the lady that ran the ministry was crying as she was telling. Is that, that's awesome. Is that great? I mean, you know, you, you see that and you're like, man, I, I'm glad to be a part of that. That's good. But listen. That doesn't happen if the people of God are not generous. If we don't give, the ministry doesn't flourish. You know, and honestly, there's some things we're not doing in our church right now because our our giving is not where it needs to be. I'm just being very candid with you today. But I tell you what, I'm so excited because I envision a fully resourced church where all the people of God are bringing tithes And this church is reaching people and marriages are being saved and addictions are being broken and lives are being transformed and the glory of God is being exalted. And as we give, ministry flourishes. That's something to get excited about, see? So you're not just, you know, going on to edgechurch.com and making a little gift and, oh, well, whatever. No, no, no. Every weekend in this room... God is doing sacred things, and we're all a part of that. Every one of us. Ministry flourishes. Ministry flourishes. Ministry flourishes. Our Shake the City project. Ministry flourishes. We celebrated our two-year mark last week. And the great things that God has been doing over the last 24 months through our building, right? Because it wasn't that long ago, guys, we used to meet in a school. And many of you weren't here for that because the church has grown a lot since then. But we used to meet in a dirty, stinky school. But listen... People gave, and the ministry flourished, and we now have our own building where we can do ministry, like student takeover this last weekend, where I was taking out kids in dodgeball, which was a great amount of fun, and where kids were giving their life to Christ. It's awesome. It's all of it. Ministry flourishes. Number three, God is glorified. What happens when I tithe? God is glorified. Uh, Philippians 4.18 says, I have received full payment, and I have... More than enough, I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you have sent, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. So see, when we give, God is glorified. Isn't that beautiful? It gives glory to God. See, nobody else may know what you're giving, but God does, and he's the one that's exalted. And the mission of our church is to exalt the name of God. It's to exalt his name. Number four, my influence is increased. My influence has increased. They share freely and give generously to those in need. This is Psalm 112, verse 9. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. They will have influence and honor. And so the psalmist ties generosity to influence and legacy. Amen. 
How many of us would like to, to feel like that when we died one day, that we left a legacy in the ministry of what God was doing in the church? Is that awesome? Yeah. Is that cool? Something that extends well beyond our lifetime. Last time I checked, one out of one people die. Somebody may need to check the math on that. I think I'm right. But every one of us has a legacy. What will go on? How will our influence be used well beyond our lifetime? And giving is a huge part of that. So let's look at generosity as influence, as the psalmist said here. It expands our influence. The message says in Proverbs eleven twenty four, the world of the generous gets larger and larger, and the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. God, give me a bigger heart and a more generous heart so that I can have a bigger heart for you. That's what he's saying. Yeah. God wants to do the same in our lives, doesn't he? And finally, bringing tithes helps me find joy. Okay, it's fun to give. It's fun to bless others. It's, it's fun to see ministry take place. Acts 20 verse 35 says it like this. There is more happiness in giving than receiving. So generosity increases our happiness. Um, if you aren't generous, you don't know that. But if you are generous, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you know that you find joy in blessing other people and seeing ministry flourish and God do great things. So we find joy in that. Uh, when I was a kid, Christmas was all about me. I'm telling you, my parents used to buy great Christmas presents. I loved Christmas. I did. I got all these really cool toys. And then I became an adult, and guess what? My parents quit buying me such cool presents. It started going to my kids. My kids were getting all the presents. And I was like, I used to get the hookup. And now the grandkids get the hookup. <laughs> it's a difference. And then I started buying presents for my kids, and I started to understand something. As I got older, it was less about me, and it was more about others. I, I hope that that's your prayer in your spiritual journey with Christ, is that as you grow older, that it would be less about you, and it would be more about others. And the older you get in your faith, and the longer you walk with Christ, and the more that you journey with the Lord, the more it's about others. And the less that it's about you. That's our prayer today. That's our prayer today. It's a mindset. How do we become people that bring tithes to God? We got to change our mindset. We got to change our mindset. We got to look at our priorities. We got to look at our priorities and say, God, some people may prioritize beauty, some people may prioritize biceps, but God, I want to prioritize you above everything else and I want you to be first in my life. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer?